and turn the front speakers up just a little bit. And y'all tell me when we get rid of that, uh, that bounce back feedback thing. Does that sound better? Sound better? Testing, testing. A little bit more in the front, please. More, more. There we go. Now turn the back down just a hair. <laughs> Frank's busting his eardrums back there. Does that sound good back there now? No? It sound good? Okay. Praise God. Well, we uh, want to get into the Word this morning, and uh, I hope you, you have come to receive from the Lord. His Word changes us. His Word transforms us. Keep in mind, His Word that He first spoke when He said, Let there be light, is no doubt still creating universes across that we can't even see. Because once God speaks... His word is encapsulated and continues on forever and ever and ever. If that be the case, then how much more can God's word be transforming to us to continue the creative process within us of knowing him, that we might hear him, fellowship with him? And what about the transformation? You know, I mean, you know who you are. You know that sticky character that's inside that's done those things in the past. You, you know all about yourself. So we are totally dependent upon the Holy Spirit through the living word and breath of God of changing us and transforming us. Now, I, I want to give you a, a, a word here. This is in Ecclesiastes 2.26. For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. Now, who gives those things? God does. We need wisdom. Why? Because we're going to get an information in the future. There's all kinds of information stations waiting. The enemy has his. His is usually really plush. Come by and get your information here. He'll make sure that he plugs it in. He broadcasts. He's got a bullhorn. He'll stand in front. Of you. He'll give you the information he wants you to have. What we need is wisdom to make a determination of what knowledge is from God, what knowledge is from our own thinking, and what knowledge is from the enemy himself. So it's God himself who's made a determination. He wants to give us wisdom, knowledge, and joy to the man who is good in his sight. Did you realize that? He gives that to the man who is good in his sight. He does not give that to the man that is not good in his sight. Now, if you're a woman, uh, don't get alarmed that we're just talking about men here. God said in the beginning that he made man male and female. So if you hear me reference man, you're a female man. Now, you might not like that, but <laughs> you got your name from Adam in the garden. You know, God presented you to him, and Adam woke up and opened his eyes. And he goes, whoa. So you were a woe man from then on, and you still woe us. Now, I, I went to the thought process of what God wants to take us and where he wants to take us. Now, how many of you have had some fights in the last, uh, you're fighting life or life's fighting you. There's all kinds of drama, trauma. There's things coming at you sideways and from here and that way. And you wonder, oh, holy smokes, how did I get into this? Where's this coming from? Why is it showering down upon me? And if you're the only one that feels that way, you're the only one in here, right? <laughs> how many of you feel that way? Ah, we got some people that aren't voting, huh? <laughs> I'm not going to call any names. Somebody told me the other day, I don't raise your hand when you ask me to raise your hand because I don't want to be the one to raise my hand. <laughs> like, oh, okay. I want you to think about this, and I'm going to show you a little skit, and then we're going to get into the word itself. And I think I am ready for the video. If you kill the lights first, that would be good. And make sure we have sound. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that yell back there. Rotten Romans. Well, uh, commiserations, Luke. Uh, yet another convincing victory to the Lions. Well, yeah, very disappointing for the Christians. But uh, when all said and done, you know, we had, we had some very unfortunate injuries early on. Didn't favour us that Jono got his leg chewed off in the first minute. That did seem to affect his pace a bit. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, fair play to the Lions attack. You know, I mean, they ripped us to pieces. I mean, there was an arm here, there was a leg there. And uh, our striker simply lost his head, was bitten clean off. You know. And it has affected your record. That's Lions 160, Christians nil. You have to be gutted. Ah, well, very nearly. Um, but uh, luckily I was a bit too quick for the Lions. Uh, do you think that the Christians will ever beat the Lions? Uh, well, we'll just take each game as it comes. So, no? No, not a prayer, no. Uh, we do have some good news, though. Oh, have you found me leg? <laughs> oh, no, oh, oh. Hey. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, we haven't found your leg, but we have decided to give you our Man of the Match Award. There you are. Bless you. Uh, mainly, of course, for your uh, great uh, performance in the arena, but also because you're the only one left alive. <laughs> oh! 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 
too soon. Horrible histories. That I showed you that for a reason. It is because it's uh, part of our history. Now, what, 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 what was this guy lacking? He was going into an arena, right? He was going to be fed to the lions. Or he was going to face gladiators, and he's a Christian, he's wearing a sheet, and he's wearing a little cross, and okay, that's what I'm going to do, I'm going to go out there and face the lions. Now, I want you to know, the scripture gives us instructions of how to prepare for these things. Did you know that? And it's not in a bed sheet with a cross. Instead, it's with the Lord's presence. It's with him. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his strength and his might and pull on the full, put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So when we look at this little film, there is this ground that Satan wants us to send, send us to that we have no defenses. Now, should we be on the ground, number one, his ground? We have to move off of his ground if we're going to take a stand. We have to be able to recognize the devil's schemes, and if we can't recognize the devil's schemes, then all we do is go out there and say, well, I guess we'll fight the Christians and we'll hope for the best. I mean, fight the lions and hope for the best. I'm telling you, the enemy has lions that will take us down if we're on his ground. We've got to be able to recognize the ground and get to safe ground. That's the first thing that God wants us to do. Now, you can't find safe ground unless you can hear his voice. That's why the scripture makes the statement, Ephesians 6.10, finally... Be strong in the Lord. What Lord? Who's Lord? Is it God the Father? Is it God the Son? Is that the Holy Spirit? I think, personally, you have to become revelatory in your thought process that if you invited Jesus Christ inside you, the Lord, He is the Lord. He is the one that is our Lord and made our Lord and our King. If He's in there, then we need to begin to associate with Him under his conditions and terms that he wants us to associate with him. There's many people that won't associate with him on his terms and his conditions. We want him to associate with us. We want him to come onto our turf. Our turf may be belonging to the enemy. It's from our, if it's from our past and our own thinking, our mindset, if it's a history that we have built, remember the horrible history thing there? <laughs> if it's a history we have built, that's not necessarily inclusive of God's plan for us. I find more often that Christianity or pseudo-Christianity is sold by the bushel basket of come and get this God that you can domesticate to get him to do what you want him to do for your life. And God all the time is saying, I'm not domesticatable. <laughs> You're the one that's supposed to be my wife. Now, who's supposed to be the domestic? Ah, I am. But if I want to domesticate him, it's not going to work. That means I want him to come and clean up my mess. I want him to clean the kitchen. I want him to prepare the meal. I want him to provide for me. I, I want him to make me happy. I want him to give me what I want. I want him to make my bed for me. I, I want him to carry out my trash. I want him to clean up the mess. I want him to get that person in line over there and get that uh, straighten up this. Does that sound like a, a child of God or does that sound like someone that's a spoiled kid? our thought process we must change our thought process of saying I want to make you Lord if we make Jesus Lord then we must become strong it says finally be strong in the Lord you can't be strong in him unless he's Lord and you let him sit on your throne and then it says that you're supposed to be strong in the strength of his might. What is the strength of his might? Anybody know what the strength of his might is? So that's a religious term thrown out there. No, it's not. The strength of his might, who came to earth and breathed upon Mary and brought forth a perfect God child on earth. Was it not the Holy Spirit? And who anointed Jesus to go forth and do miracles on earth? Was that not the power of God, the mighty power of God? Was that not the Holy Spirit? And when Jesus, every manner of miracle he did, he did through the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to take you to one other scene, and that was him coming out of the chasms of the place of the dead. Who is the one that brought him forth out of the place of the dead? The mighty power that was used, the Holy Spirit is the one that opened the place of the dead 
and brought Jesus forth. So when he says, be strong in the Lord and be strong in his might, it means we're also supposed to be strong in spiritual things concerning the Holy Spirit, not having knowledge about him. Knowledge does no good about him. Pharisees had that. Sadducees had that. Children of Israel had knowledge about the Holy Spirit. They acknowledged his presence. They acknowledged that he was a complete form of God. They acknowledged that he was all-powerful. But they didn't receive him. They didn't, weren't filled up with the full power of him. Now, if we're going to be facing lions, which uh, how many of you faced lions the last couple of years and lost, huh? And you came out and you got that interview with that guy. And, well, how'd the lion thing go there? <laughs> oh, you, 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 you all didn't make it there, huh? We have to, well, yeah, but we're going to try harder next time. Well, why should we try harder on Satan's ground? When God has given us some real tools that can take down a lion on his ground. He's given us some real things that can bring protection for us in our emotions, protection for us in our relationships, protection for our children, protection for a life. God wants you to have a life. If you're not blessed here, then uh, when I say blessed, I mean living a, a life with enough in it to take care of yourself and enough left over to help someone, and enough left over of, Lord, here's your share. Now, that's what Scripture calls blessed. It's not being the ultra-mega rich people. They're not blessed. They're absent of the Lord's presence, most of them are. Why? Because their focus is upon finances. Now, I, I want you to understand that God gave a command put on the full armor of God. If the little guy that was saying he's a Christian standing here, if he'd had on full armor and he went out, to face the lions, even if it was on Satan's turf, would he have been missing a leg? I submit to you, I don't think so. Not if he was fully suited and he had all the armament that God had. Now, two things I want to point out to you in giving you this little scenario. One, our fight is not against flesh and blood. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Pinch yourself, what are you? You're flesh and blood. Now, we too often get in wrestling matches with each other. Wrestling matches, he said, she said, they did, they didn't do. We're always worried about what someone else is doing, and then we revert and we turn it upon ourselves, and we're worried about what we've done or what we haven't done. Are we not flesh and blood too? The Scripture says, through the Spirit, that our fight is not against flesh and blood. If it's not against flesh and blood, then who's it against? Is it not against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness and against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places? Now, what that means is that there are, in the Greek, that's a Greek term of cosmocraters, ruling cosmocraters. And the reason I want to point your head there right now is because if our fight's not against the job looking for it, if our fight's not against our wives and husbands and children and finances and bosses and the things that we're not getting, then there's someone else involved in this. In every order or decision that you make, there's someone else that's involved in the outcome of that. Now, I don't think I'm not a demon chaser, I don't go out and look under bushes and all that stuff. But I can tell you there is a force that is here on earth that is a supernatural force that is not from God. God originally made that supernatural force. It coexists with us in this dimension. It can't take physical form anymore, thank God. Before the flood, they could take physical form here. Man really had his hands full when these demonic forces could take physical form. Uh, God really relieved the earth when he washed those things away. Now, I, I want you to take your thought process. If there's another being involved in this, right now, if you went down and signed up for a driver's license, there's an office of registration that you go to. There's an official place that takes a picture of you. There's an official place that the state certifies you can drive. And an official comes and sits in the car with you. An official gives you a test, and he grades that test. And after you pass all those things, then that official government gives you an official driver's license. But did you know also that if you're from 
uh, say, not the United States and you needed false ID, there's a place that you can go to get a driver's license and get a Social Security card and get credit cards and get birth certificates and all that stuff. It, it, I, I don't know of any big, big t I don't know of many big towns that don't have some shade of darkness where somebody else is printing ID and printing authorizations that are not real. And if we get stopped and not using a real driver's license, we go to jail, right? Uh, wait a minute, you're not licensed driver here, and what are you doing doing a U-turn 75 miles an hour in the middle of the freeway? I haven't learned the lessons, I haven't learned the law. I, I, our fight is not against the flesh and blood of human beings, nor law, nor governments of this world. Our fight is with these demonic forces and the information that they give us. Now, they cannot take your hand and say, okay, take the cup, take the cup, okay, pick up the cup, now throw it on this person. Oops, sorry, Bob. <laughs> they, they can't make me do that. However, they can speak to me. My fight with them is they still have the capability to speak into my thought process. And the problem is, if we're not trained and don't put on the armor, then we're subject to them changing our understanding about the reality of the situation of what's going on. If they change the reality of it, then we become like the mob that was killing Jesus. Do you realize they're standing in front of the cross? And Jesus is looking down on them. And what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them. Didn't he, didn't he say that? He's praying that prayer. And they're down there saying, die, you heretic. You led my kid astray. Die, you heretic. You caused my son to die. Die, you heretic. You false healer. They're, they're down there screaming their lungs out. Enraged. Now, why are they enraged? It's because there's demonic forces speaking to them, telling them of what he represents and who he is, rather than listening to God. So Jesus Christ looks down with his spiritual eyes, and he sees the demonic forces interacting with the human beings. And when he sees that they're telling them something different, they're not using their own thought process. They're hearing something different. And he looks and he says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. There is much forgiveness that would come in our heart towards people who do things to us if we could see the information they got and that was poured into them as poison. We would see somebody that's filled with arsenic and they're foaming at the mouth and coughing and hacking and growling and wanting to bite and hate something that somebody else put in them. Well, that someone else is always Satan. That someone else is always a demonic force. Now, God says that he has set up a remedy for this, and it is his armament. He has some armament. Now, we're supposed to be calling 911 of, Lord, uh, I need a rescue here. I need out of the lion pit. Because when you're facing alliance, that's not the time to gather armor. <laughs> we, we, we need to be in his presence, on his ground, fellowshipping with him in order to get the armor. You've got to get ears to be able to hear, because if you don't get ears to be able to hear, you won't be able to locate the armor. Now, something good I want to tell you is God is for us. He's not against us. Jesus Christ came to deliver us from the enemy, did he not? He came to deliver us from the enemy. We're not defenseless if he's our defense. And instead of us interacting and fighting and all the complications and problems that we have, if we will listen to Jesus, he will walk us around the minefield that Satan lays. Yeah, how many of you know people that it's just, a, you, you come up to them, you want to love on them, but wow, if I open that subject... Boom! <laughs> There's a minefield there. Okay, I'll tiptoe around that one. And all of a sudden, boom, something else goes off. You know, well, I, I didn't know about that one, really. And everywhere you step, there's a minefield laid so that they're going off. They're going off. Well, who laid the minefield? They didn't. The enemy has taken their thought captive, their mind captive, and he's pouring in false information that they have a defensive system that you're stepping into and then out of their perspective is, 
Oh, so the enemy has convinced me that that person's after me. That person's trying to destroy me. That person doesn't believe anything I say. That person wants to cast down. That person just wants to control me. Out of all the information this person is receiving of, wow, that's not a safe person. I need to get a minefield out here. <laughs> I got to let them know when that subject comes up, we're not going to talk about it. Person goes on. Now, are they not trying to act reasonable and prudent in their defense of their own actions? And there can be some evil thoughts in there for the person too. And my point is, is that the enemy will pit us against each other so that we're fighting against each other rather than trying to come to God. If we want to, we can change the scenario that we saw instead of us just constantly going on Satan's turf and the lion's eating us and we lose another leg and we know we're going to lose that battle. We can come in through the Spirit, because these are spiritual things that we're talking about. The weapons that we fight with, uh, I got it here for you. For though we walk in the bodily form, we do not war according to what our own mind tells us to. But the weapons we fight with are not through our own thinking, but they are divinely inspired from God, by God, from the heavens. Something poured out here on earth from the Holy Spirit bringing a divine providence of God's power to the earth. Do you believe His power is here? And the scripture says in the last days that the, his, the pseudo-church or the anti-church will turn away from Him and they will no longer believe in the Spirit. They'll no longer believe in the power of the Spirit. We need to be careful not to become that pseudo-church. Instead, that same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that same power is supposed to be transforming us. And we need that transformation to take place. So, one, in this passage of Scripture, there's a statement that there are weapons of warfare, but they're not of the flesh. They're divinely powerful for the destruction of the fortress of the dark one. They're divinely powerful for coming and bringing down his strongholds that he has put in our lives. And where do we give him his rights? Uh, the Lord gave me this picture one time of me being up on a plateau, and I'd, I'd made it up into a new euphoric area with him, and it was wonderful. Oh, praise God. It's just the enemy so far away, and I remember where I was down there involved in all those things, and you delivered me, oh Lord, and I'm, I'm really up here walking with you. And all of a sudden, I heard a voice, and it was the enemy's voice. And I thought, how did you get up here? And I went over and looked down, and there was a long wall that went straight down, maybe a thousand feet, but there was blocks of stone sticking out, like a set of stairs that he could come up. Some of my rights and some of my will gave him permission to come up to the new plane of relational functionality that I had with God. So that he couldn't walk up on that plane, but he could stand close to it and he could speak. As we're pursuing our God, we can get into new revelational positions, new spiritual positions, new functionalities with our God. But if we get stuck in our rights and in our anger and in our frustration and our silliness of, I want this in our demands, those are like those stones that he just pulls himself up. Now, he can't come and walk in the garden of delight with you and God, but he can speak to you. And because he was plugged into us from birth, it can change what our mind thinks. He can change so much what our mind thinks that it becomes arduous to come and be in God's presence. Like, oh, well, i got to go be in His. Where, do, where does that thought come from? Of, oh, oh, I'm so tired. I don't know if I can. But yet, I mean, if you're a guy, well, the football game started. You, you don't even think about being tired. Where do those thoughts come from? And, you know, of course, me and my wife, we... We ride together in the same car. We actually don't anymore. It's not because we're mad at each other. We just come at different times. But, you know, have you ever ridden with your spouse to church and you get there, you, your blood's boiling because there was some conversation that went on that shouldn't have gone on? That's the enemy stirring those things. We do not recognize how he gets to us. And what he wants to stop us from doing is having a deep spiritual experience with Jesus Christ in person through the Holy Spirit. Because we are changed and transformed when we honestly have a deep spiritual experience and are touched by him. Now, he doesn't want just to touch us. He wants to teach us to walk with him. And he understands that the enemy is going to come. And his question to us is, when will you follow my instructions? 
be filled with my spirit and learn how to put on these spiritual things that will protect you when he comes. If you could just recognize the enemy. Suppose there was a midget come rollerblading by here and they come in and crash service and start hollering and screaming and uh, you know making all kinds of accusations. Are you going to be afraid? Well, no, it's something small. It just makes noise. It's got wheels. We can push it out. <laughs> In our understanding of demonic forces, we need to understand that Jesus Christ is the one that's all-powerful. They are not. But if we cannot see them, there's where the problem is. If we cannot hear them. Now, I want to give you some more passages of Scripture. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against the powers and against the world forces of darkness. It solely states that's where our fight is. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. What does the armor of God consist of? You know, Paul, when he's writing this, he's writing this to the Ephesians. There's connotations in one of his letters that he was fed to the lions here. There's statements in history that the lions didn't eat him. So he was very acquainted, especially with the amphitheater that was there that seated 25,000. There was another stadium that they had chariot races in that could seat near 75,000 there in Ephesus. We don't know which one that he was fed to the lions out, but he, he returned out of that safely. And my point being... It was a gladiator scene. It was people walking up and down the streets. And fighting that took place when you went to war, it was not long-range fighting like we do with bullets today. Satan doesn't shoot us with many bullets. Instead, he gets up right in our face, and he's real close. And when you think he's your friend, he takes a knife and, or an ice pick and sticks it in your back. And everything that takes place, he came to kill, steal, and destroy. And if we can begin just simply to recognize the difference between our voice and his voice. We cannot recognize the difference between his voice and our voice unless we're willing to continue in our spiritual journey and be obedient to our Lord Jesus Christ when he said, go and wait. Go and wait. For 40 days they waited until the Holy Spirit came. He said, basically, you will have no power in your life until he comes. We need to understand, if we're going to be facing spiritual forces, we're going to have need of the Holy Spirit and his power to face those spiritual forces. We cannot, fa we cannot face them in our own understanding. We cannot face them using Scripture. And you remember uh, the seven sons of Scavi, which was a, was, was a high priest. It was right there in Ephesus, matter of fact. Uh, not the high priest in Jerusalem, but he was chief over the synagogue. His sons, uh, they were real influential. And keep in mind, this city was anywhere from 250,000 to 500,000 at this time. It was one of the major cities of the world. And uh, these seven sons have seen so many healings, have seen Jesus do so many things through Paul, that they're out casting out demons out of people, truly bringing deliverances to people in the name of Jesus until they run into one of these demonic forces that is uh, uh, not a, the small little guy. This is one of the main henchmen of Satan. And they said, we command you in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches to come out. And the demonic force hollering back at them. Jesus, I know, and Paul, I've heard about, but who are you? And that demonic force leapt upon them and literally ripped their clothes to shreds and uh, battered them like a crazy man of beating them to pieces. In the Greek, it gives the connotations that they barely escaped with their lives. It was not a small scene of just a robe being torn it was more of a scene of him blocking the door and breaking bones and beating eyes out and teeth out and pulling ears off and biting noses off. And it, 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 there's a scene 
painted in the Greek that's similar to that of what happened to them, of them trying to use natural forces to deal with spiritual forces. And there's part of the problem. We need to come into a different mindset. How can we come into a different mindset? Well, one, we take on the mind of Christ. Two, we energize the mind of Christ within us and program the mind of Christ with the Holy Spirit by inviting the Holy Spirit to come inside of us. Now the Holy Spirit can take the word, the written word, the logos, and he can begin to translate that so that our spiritual mind that we have in Jesus can begin to understand what Scripture says. Why I'm telling you this is because the Scripture says the man without the Spirit, without the Holy Spirit, cannot even understand the Word of God. That's why we have so many commentaries out there. These guys sit and don't have the Holy Spirit. and uh, there's, there, there's millions of commentaries from fools that don't know God. I'm telling you, the Sadducees and Pharisees had millions of commentaries, and Jesus said, you don't know me, you don't know the Father. You don't know the heart of him who sent me. Now, my purpose is not to wreck down on uh, men who are aspiring to, to know God. There, there are some. There are some. But it, am I not correct in saying, do you not see a change in our society? Have you not seen that within the last 20 to 30 years? Have you personally witnessed our nation going from one of just being normal to all of a sudden paranormal and abnormal in their wicked thoughts and their wicked ways and excelling at chasing after darkness and causing darkness and the party scene that used to be a simple party scene when I was young it's not a party simple party scene now it is filled with everybody talking about what manner of darkness they can do and where they can do it and who they can do it to there's been this outpouring of this spiritual realm that has been coming in upon the world, and the world has been receiving it with open arms and being transformed into that darkness. The scripture says in the last days that as it was in the days of Mo Noah, so it would be in the last days. And what was it like in the days of Noah? The demonic forces ruled the planet Earth. They had cohabitated and they had crossbred with every human being with the exception of Noah and his family. And that I'm giving you passages of Scripture where it says that his seed was not tarnished. Well, what does that say about everybody else's seed? Now, they, they lost the right to cohabitate here on the face of the earth, but they didn't lose the right to go in this altered dimension called the second heaven and be able to speak to us. Now, if we can track and identify the difference between our voice and their voice, now we can turn off their communicator. It gives us more liberty to be able to hear our Lord. We're talking spiritual things here, and we're talking spiritual armament. Now, I have seen a lot of people in the charismatic movement and in the evangelical movement of, well, since I belong to Jesus, I got the, I got the, the, the shield of faith. I'm just believing God. And I've got the sword of the Spirit. And I, I've got the helmet of salvation. I've got, and, and, but yet their life is not lived much different than anyone else's life. I don't see the purity there. I don't see the change there. I don't see the peace there. I don't see, I don't see any change that indicates that they have any form of defense that they say they have. But however... People who seek after the Spirit and learn to walk in the Spirit. A Holy Spirit is the one that comes and dresses and arrays us. He puts clothes of righteousness upon us. He's the one that changes and transforms the heart so more of Jesus can be within us. We need more of Jesus within us. More of his mind, more of his functionality. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can do that within us. Oh, there's a spiritual gifts, and I could talk to you all day about the spiritual gifts, and I think we're pretty much up to speed on spiritual gifts. What I'm talking about is how about us take the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, for what He was sent for, and begin to allow Him to transform our mind and equip us with some spiritual equipment so that we can shut down what these guys say so that our reality is not altered. If your reality is altered, you're going to do the wrong thing. Why? Because you're literally prudently trying to look at something and trying to figure it out through your own reasoning. And I know, I'll do the Bible bounce. Oh, well, there's this scripture. 
Remember, Satan knows Scripture inside out. But what he doesn't know is the mind and heart of God. And what he doesn't know is what the Holy Spirit speaks to us and how he speaks to us. What he doesn't know is the glorification of Jesus coming and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, how it transforms us to hear the heart of God so that we can begin to sense the difference between what is right and what is wrong. We lost that capability of distinguishing what is right and wrong when we were in the garden. Man has never been able to recapture the difference between what is right and what is wrong until Jesus comes and then the Holy Spirit comes. Why? Jesus basically told his disciples, you're powerless in any defense against the enemy until my spirit comes and you're endowed with him. So make it one of your determinate factors in life to, one, obey Jesus, seek the Spirit with all your heart, mind, soul, and body. He is the single member of the Godhead who's in charge of planet Earth right now. When Jesus came, he was a single man that was in charge of planet Earth representing the complete Godhead. When he returned to the Father, he and the Father made the statement that they were sending the Holy Spirit as the single representative for planet Earth. If we ignore him and don't obey what he has to say. Matter of fact, what's the unforgivable sin? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. I just, I'm throwing that out there so you understand he's a member of the Godhead. And he's here. And he's waiting to teach us how to interact with the living God. Now, let's get on into the passages of Scripture. I want to read this in a Phillips trans translation. For... Uh, Therefore, take up the full armor of God. Now, armor of God consists of shoulder pads because there's a vital nerves and bones that are in here that if something comes down and hits them. Now, what, what we went on on the shoulder pads of the priest, do you remember? <laughs> there were special stones that went there that represented the 12 tribes of Israel, six on each shoulder pad. What that is saying is there's defenses in us being a family. Your shoulders are the, what holds up a sword. And if you want the sword of the Spirit, one of the first things the Spirit will do is come and immerse you and baptize you into a body so that you're joined with one another. There's great defenses within that. Be careful what you join, though. We need to join something that knows the Lord that the Lord's Spirit is active, that His healing power is at work, that His manifest presence is revealing itself, and that they're brothers and sisters in Christ that are becoming holy, being transformed, and they hear the voice of the Lord. Because if the congregation doesn't reflect that, then it doesn't reflect that from the pulpit, and the leader doesn't reflect that. If the leader doesn't reflect that, if he's not going into the presence of the Lord, then how can the congregation get in the presence of the Lord? Whenever I look and see every man of God that God has sent, the prerequisite of that man of God was one that he was holy. One, that he knew God. He knew how to get into God's presence. He could hear God directly. And he was to direct the people of how to get in the presence of God. Not be there, hey, I'm your leader. Instead, there's the leader. Let's go to him. <laughs> it's, it's not one of standing in between, but it's one of running ahead. I remember what Gandhi said. He said ah, there, there go the people and I'm their leader. <laughs> you know, He was always behind God. Wants his men of God looking at him and, and, and looking back and saying, do you see him? Do you see him? He's, he's right there. Oh, oh, you don't, you don't have your glasses? Here, let me get your glasses straightened up. Now do you see him? You know, and somebody else said a little bit further back, and then, well, I can't see him. Well, let me give you some binoculars, because if we can just locate that Jesus is real in our midst, is there any of us that would not run to him? Now, I'm taking a little side trip here, and the reason being is because part of the armor has to do with us being knit together. And Jesus made the statement that he himself would immerse us into a body so that we could be joined together. He's the one that does the baptism of us into a body. And I, I for the most part, uh, you know, I've been around churches or now for, I don't know, 50 years, something like that, and walking in the Spirit for 43 years, and and, 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 and I've seen people just, oh, well, I like that one. They've got something for my kids. And I like that one over there because uh, they got something for young couples. And I like that one over there. And they're talking about programs or something. 
church is supposed to be about us seeking a God. Us seeing him, us hearing him, us being transformed by him, us coming and saying, oh, God, do you have a word for me? Life is on fire back here. We need a place that he would come and that he would speak and that he would put out those things and that he would reveal himself. We don't need a good Sam club. We need a place that he would come and he would stand in our midst. And he would bring the vitality of his breath and he would bring the refreshing until we become like him. And when I sense him and when I feel him come close, then hope comes. When I sense him and feel him come close, then the enemy runs out of the building. When I sense him and feel him come close, it, it gives me an understanding. It doesn't matter what's gone on in the past. You have my future now. And the Lord many times has come and picked this crumpled body up from being involved in the world and drug me out of the lion's den where I went to feed the kitty and pet him like a fool that I was. I mean, how many times have you went to feed the kitty? <laughs> Satan says, oh, it's an animal. You're an animal lover, aren't you? Come over here, pet the kitty. <laughs> Whatever issue it is, you end up in rags. <laughs> and you come hopping out on the, yep, yep, well, lost that one. Don't well, well, understand what happened, but we'll try again. No. We need to stop going in the lion's den. We need to get on God's ground because if we are on his ground, he can dress us and array us. And the first thing he will do, will put us in robes of righteousness. Do you understand what it would be like to be out in the desert, 120 degrees. I've been in the Mojave Desert and seen a thermometer push 130 degrees. Can you imagine putting metal against your skin a suit of armor against your skin without some sort of robe between you and it? And what about if I take you to the Arctic? I, I used to work up in the Arctic. I've seen it 87 below zero. You could spit and it would freeze for it to hit the ground. I actually, you could throw a cup of coffee out and there would be cubes of ice landing on the ground out there if you threw it far enough. <laughs> 87 below zero. Can you imagine having raw metal against you without something to insulate? So before we ever get to the point that we can put on robes of righteousness, we must be washed by our Lord. Are you willing to let him wash you? Are you willing to let him look by what's behind your ears? Yeah, I find that interesting. Let me see your hands. Let me see your nails. Let me see behind your ears. You remember that little drill? Well, I, I think God does that. He said, let me see what's in your ears. What are you listening to? Who are you listening to? Let me get that ball of wax out of there so you can hear me. Let me get the dirt out of there that the enemy deposited in there. God is willing to help us in every way. Why? Because he says that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. Are you afflicted? I am. I, I, I get my hand up real quick. I said, you afflicted? I am. Why? Because then... He has to come, and he's the anointed one if I'm the afflicted one. <laughs> if you're not willing to admit that you're afflicted, he, he, he can't come. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. That's me. The lion's been chewing on me. To proclaim liberty to the captives and to set free the prisoners. He came to free us from a lifestyle that dominates our thoughts to bring sorrow, dominates our thoughts to bring hopelessness, dominates our thoughts that there's, that, 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 that of depression, dominates our thoughts of, oh, I've spoiled it, I've ruined everything, nothing, will, oh, God, I, I, I'm just such a, I, I, oh, God, you know, you, you get to the point you don't even know what to pray or how to pray. God said, I understand that you're captive. And when it, he comes to set us free, who is the one that has captured us? The enemy. He always captures us in our thinking. He always captures us in what he has to say to us that leads us away from God. But Jesus, the Holy Spirit, wants to put a helmet upon us that we can pull it down over our ears and say, no, I'm not listening to anything. And then you know what? There's earbuds in there. <laughs> a Jesus speaking to you. His voice, his heart. Take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the day of evil. Do you know there's going to be a day of evil that comes, right? So if we're going to take up the full armor of God, it, we had shin plates. We've got uh, steel plates that go on top of the foot because somebody can ram a spear in it. We've got leather thongs that hang down to protect. There's a belt of truth. 
There's actually armed plates that have little scales that can move, so you can move. And if an arrow comes, it cannot make it through, nor can a spear. And besides the body plating, and all those have to do with spiritual elements, and I don't have time to go into those. Boy, I wish we could have a seminar, because we you could probably walk out of here with the whole box full of this stuff and be putting it on and drag it around the house and play with it for a little while, and then hold it up and watch it hold out something. Hold it up and watch it hold out something. I'll read this to you, and then I'm going to finish with a short story. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist the day of evil. And having done everything to stand, we're going to have to talk about having done everything to stand. They were in the wrong arena. They were in the wrong place to take their stand. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with the truth. Ah, one of those undergarments so that we can put on the armor. We cannot put on any armor if we will not live in truth. We have no armor if we are living in any form of deception, any form of control, any form of delusion. Why? Because armor cannot be placed directly against our skin. It will damage us more than the enemy. It is armor of righteousness, armor that the angels wear that is spiritual armor spiritual things coming in contact with the flesh the flesh must die do you understand that the flesh must die if the flesh comes in contact with spiritual forces whether darkness or on God's side if no flesh will stand in front of him all flesh must die there must be robes of righteousness put upon us if we're going to put something spiritual upon us that stands in God's presence to insulate us from his wrath, to insulate us from his judgments. And then it becomes a form of protection that Jesus standing in between the judgments of God being our righteousness, the Holy Spirit being the sanctifier, another robe that is around us. And what is the Holy Spirit? He's the spirit of truth. If you're unwilling to walk in him, if you're unwilling to receive him, if you're unwilling to do the things the spirit says, then you cannot put on the belt of truth. The belt of truth is buckled around you. It is snapped into place and it cannot be pulled off of you unless your body comes in too. The Holy Spirit must be a formed to us so that truth stands between us and the armament that God wants to put on us. If his armament can take down evil, there must be an insulation and a change of the evil that's within us. And the Holy Spirit is the garment that is the buffer and the changer. So righteousness comes, Jesus comes as the outer shell. But the sanctification of the Holy Spirit and the truth is underneath that to change the heart, to change the mind, to change what is inside. At this point in time, I have access to the weapons of warfare that will protect us and change our future. Seek after the Spirit. Maybe in our next session we'll be able to cover how to put on these things, where to find them how to take a stand and what that looks like and where and how to hear the very voice of God. He says, in addition to this, take up the shield of feet. I passed up something. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to this, to all, take up the shield of faith, which is able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. What's the, what's the sword? The spirit, again which is the Word of God. Now, that Word of God in Greek is not Logos. It is the Rhema. Let me read that to you as it says it in the Greek. And take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the spoken word from the presence of the living God. That's a little bit different than me going and trying to read something in Scripture. It's not Logos. The word is Rhema in the Greek, which means there's a voice with someone standing there speaking it. There is what we need from the Spirit, the voice of God standing there speaking it to us. If his voice is there standing speaking to us, his sword swings around and takes out the enemy. 
his sword swings the other way and takes out the enemy. If the voice is not there, there's no sword there. I've seen many people try to hit people with the Bible, you know. Let me get you straightened out. Pow, pow. <laughs> no, no, that's not the sword of the Spirit. <laughs> get into God's presence and be saturated so much that when his voice is there, it is a sharp, two-edged sword that will cut the enemy down, that will bring truth to the situation, that will set you free, that will bring deliverance, bring revelation. His voice has that capability. Then he comes right back and he says, Now, while the voice is going on, I want you on your face in all prayer and all petition. And we talked about in our last session about fasting and praying. If we want to even have access to this armor, we must begin to fast before the Lord and say, Lord, I want you more than life. I want you more than anything. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give up this because I want my flesh to suffer. And when you see my flesh suffering, I may be out of sorts and all this stuff, but know this, I want free from my flesh. Now, that's the purpose of fasting. And God sees that and says, oh, you're serious about wanting to change that stuff, aren't you? Well, I'm going to come and help you. And he comes down in person. And he begins to help us change the flesh through our fasting and through our praying, through our supplications, through our seeking him. And then he gives us a command immediately after he talks about the voice of God being the spirit in our midst that's going to slice the enemy in half. He says, now, pray in the Holy Spirit at all times. <laughs> and with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petitions. I can go on and on and on. But I hope that you understand you do not have to remain defenseless. I would give you this thought in closing. Before we can put any armor on or find it, we must put on righteousness and the belt of truth. Righteousness comes for our association with Jesus Believing him, trusting him. And he is our righteousness. There is no other righteousness. That's why he's the king of righteousness. We, have, we cannot make our own righteousness. All we can do is obey him. In obeying him, then he imparts his righteousness to us. My wife does something I don't like, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you straight. And the Lord says, peace, be still. I say, yes, yes, my Lord. Now he extends his righteousness because I was obedient to what he had to say for that moment. We must access his righteousness. We do that through our obedience to him. The second thing we must do is come into all truth through the Holy Spirit. The greatest access there is to God is through his truth, the revelatory truth. The Holy Spirit revealed the truth to John the Revelator and said, come up here. The Holy Spirit's the one that gave him the ride. He wasn't hitchhiking. The Holy Spirit took him. He didn't have to beg him. The Holy Spirit took him and revealed truth to him that's beyond our realm of truth. Holy Spirit has the capability of revealing truth to us. The first place he will reveal that truth is the truth about Jesus, which we need to more and more about. So the revelatory process is began of, oh, Lord, you're standing here in my midst, and I didn't even know it. When that clicks on through his truth, now I have a real Lord, a real Lord that I want to make king, a real Lord that I will bow before, a real Lord that I will pursue. That's why he said to make him Lord above all. Pray in the spirit. If you've been given your prayer language, which is the language of angels, it's not a minor thing. It's not a minor thing. The language of angels, Paul said this language of angels. Think about this. <clears throat> Between here and the throne room, how many angels do you think are standing between here and the throne room? A million? Ten million? A trillion? How, how, many, how many angels does God have? How many are standing between his project Earth and his throne. See, I don't have a number either. But I think we could all agree that there's a lot, right? If there's a lot, and Paul says that this language that God gives us is so that those who are religious, he said, I want to make fools out of them. I want my people to live in so much faith 
that it will look foolish to those who are religious. They'll despise it. They'll hate it. They'll renounce it. They want nothing to do with it. They won't believe it. He said, I'm going to make it look foolish to them. He said, but unto my little ones, uh, he said, it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be a fountain of life. It's going, to be, it's going to be revelational. Now think about this. If I'm standing here praying in the language of angels, one, Satan cannot understand it. Why? He originally spoke the language of angels. He corrupted his programming where he no longer could understand it nor speak it and gave and wrote himself a new language called the language of lies. And none of the demonic forces can speak the language of angels either nor understand it. If Daniel could have prayed in the language of angels, the second he prayed, his prayer would have been answered because Satan could not have encoded it and understood it to come and stop the answer from coming from God because God dispatched the answer immediately when Daniel prayed. But there was a 21-day fight that took place in the second heaven because it was overheard. He hears your thoughts. He cannot understand the language of angels. If I'm standing here and I'm praying in the Spirit, and I, in the Spirit, if you could understand it, it would sound something like this. Jesus, I'm reporting. Let the Father know. Now, how many angels are between here and there? And I'm speaking in the language of angels. How many angels are overhearing that I need help and I'm calling upon the Father? How many angels now get involved because I'm speaking the language of angels? I'm calling upon the living God and they're looking up to the Father. Father, what do we do about this? You can hear. He's speaking to us. He's speaking to you. What? Give us orders. Give us instructions. He's telling. See, when the Holy Spirit began to speak, he identifies where Satan's standing, Satan's schemes, where our thoughts are, where our minds are, where we're being thrown to the lions, what took place in the past, what's going on in the future, what forces are around us from the enemy, and what forces of God are available to immediately be dispatched. This is not a minor thing when we pray in the Spirit, and we want to get all emotional about it and think, oh, I'm supposed to weep. I'm, oh, I'm supposed to laugh. No, I'm supposed to lay on the floor. No, we're supposed to pray in the Spirit to the living God who gave us a language that he can hear and that Satan can't understand and Satan cannot encode. If we will do that, the forces of heaven will be released to us. Why do you think when he gets through talking about all the armament and where we're supposed to stand, why do you think he ends it with saying, pray in the Spirit with all supplication? Because it's us trusting and saying, yes, Holy Spirit. You give the report. I don't have to give it with my understanding. You give the report. I need the help. I would suggest to you that you begin to write down the phonics of what words the Holy Spirit has given you. Don't try to figure out the encoded meaning. When you get through, you're going to have a whole page or a whole encyclopedia of language that angels speak. Our English language has some 80,000 words in it. I have yet. Not been able to figure out how many words the angelic language has in it but it is effective it is effective calling on the power of God calling on the provision of God it is effective calling upon the nature of God his presence his mind his heart and he responds when we just do something simple when he spoke to Abraham said, Abraham I'm gonna give you a son Abraham uh, <laughs> my wife's dead over there you, you see that <laughs> and Abraham said but I believe you and he looked like a fool to everybody. And Jesus says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And he's going to give you a new language. Men were not bashful when the Holy Spirit came. Men exercised the gift of the Spirit. I would submit to you, there is no access to any spiritual armament, no righteousness, nor truth, unless we take this serious and the instruction of the Lord and pursue him through the Spirit, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and body. We cannot please God unless we do it on a spiritual level. Do you know that's what Scripture says? We must begin to please God on a spiritual level. What pleases Him? You to pursue Him in the Spirit. You listen to the Holy Spirit. Shall we pray?
Lord, you give us such simple instructions that we make convoluted. We pour fog in around it, and so does the enemy. Instead of just doing it, just being like Abraham, of saying, oh, yes, Lord, I'll be a fool for you. But knowing the strength and the power that is released if we're just obedient, knowing a transformation process that can take place, oh, your power can drive the enemy back. Your power can rescue us. Your power can enable us to walk in a life in you that begins to make sense. A life filled with your wisdom, a life filled with your knowledge, a life filled with your joy. Come now, Lord. We ask you to get us in a position to receive more of your spirit from you. Amen. If anyone needs prayer, you can come on down and Elton and I will be glad to lay hands on you and pray for you. If not, then why don't you all have some coffee and fellowship with one another back there. And no rock throwing. <laughs>